This episode is brought to you by the University of Warwick's PGCE I and PGCE IQTS programs, specifically designed to give music teachers the qualification they need to apply for jobs around the world. Stay tuned for more information. Welcome back to the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. I'm your host, Chris Kulmer, and my guest for this episode is Rebecca Wei Chung, an MYP and DP music teacher and the MYP music subject coordinator, a mouthful, at the International School of The Hague in the Netherlands. And for long-term listeners of the podcast, you might be thinking that this school, the International School of The Hague, has come up before on the show. And yes, you would be right. I met Rebecca through Samuel Wright. Well, that's two times the use of the word right. (laughs) But anyway, you get the idea. He was my guest on episode two of the podcast and has also hosted some MTIIS conversation events for us over the last year. But I was lucky enough to get to know Rebecca last November. And as we were hanging out, she made this comment. She said, Chris, you haven't spoken to anyone on your podcast working in an international school based in the USA. And I knew there were a few international schools in the US, but she was right. I'd never explored this area specifically, and it's a fascinating area. It's almost like a reverse trajectory for international schooling, and I love it. So before moving to the Netherlands, Rebecca had worked at Atlanta International School, so she seemed like the perfect person to explore this topic with. Plus, I'm sure we'll dig into a bunch of other things too. So let's get into it. Rebecca, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me this morning. So I always like to start with a similar kind of question, which is what was your initial journey to international school music teaching? Okay, I love telling the story, actually, um, because it was very on a whim. It wasn't something that was originally planned, which I feel like is also a very common theme with a lot of other guests on the show. So I had just finished grad school and it was 2008. So of course, a time when the economy was falling out and teaching jobs were becoming scarcer and scarcer in the US. And I had taken a gig with an orchestra to actually play in China. So I went and I played in this orchestra. We did Shanghai and Beijing and Hangzhou and Suzhou. And through that, I had met someone through Fudan University in Shanghai. And after coming back to the U.S., this person sent me an email and said, hey, I know of this international school that's hiring in Shanghai for a music teacher. Would you be interested in applying? So I applied and all of this happened in about a month from finishing the tour to applying to the job to hopping back on an airplane and moving to Shanghai. And that's how I ended up with my teaching job and started that awesome adventure that lasted for six years. So when you heard of this international school in Shanghai, were you like, oh, yeah, I've heard of these things? Or was it completely new to you, the whole idea? Um, It was still a newer concept to me. I knew that there were international schools in other parts of the world. I had grown up as a military kid, so I went to DOD schools when I lived overseas in Europe as a child. But having a pure international school outside of an army or a military base was something that was new to me. So I was really excited to go and see what this international school community was all about. And just for an uninitiated Aussie, DOD is Department of Defense, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, cool. So six years in China, was it in total? Yeah, six years in total. And then back to Atlanta or to Atlanta? Yeah. So Atlanta wasn't originally going to be in the stars. I think I had been applying through, like most people, you use search associates or other job opportunities to look for schools abroad. And I had been applying at several schools and Atlanta International reached out to me and offered me an interview. And just as soon as I got on the interview and I started meeting the team, I knew that this was a place where I wanted to be. Um, They were, at the time I had been teaching a lot of project-based learning. So I hadn't gotten into the MYP yet, but I think project-based learning is very adjacent to the ideas of the MYP. And this was not only a job offer that was general music and orchestra, but also was MYP and collaborative teaching. So at the time, it wasn't just collaborative teaching, it was also co-teaching. So it was just like this really interesting mix of 
all the things that at the time I wanted in one package. And it was just the right job at the right time. And it brought me to Atlanta, Georgia, which is a place in the US that I had actually never lived before. Yeah. So give us a geography lesson here again, <laughs> probably more for me than maybe others listening. But so Atlanta and where were you before that and how far apart are those two areas? So before I'd gone to university in North Carolina, which is still on the East Coast, but, you know, south, but not too far south. But Atlanta, Georgia is considered kind of like a deep south. So southeastern U.S., but, you know, Atlanta has such a rich cultural history. It was the location where the civil rights movement started in the U.S. And it's just it's a really interesting melting pot of a city that actually has a very big international community due to a lot of international businesses that are based there. Yes. Okay. So that's starting to make a lot of sense because that was kind of one of my first thoughts was like, why would there be an international school there? So maybe we head straight for this topic in a sense. What was it like working in an international school then in your home country in the US? I think AIS is a very interesting place because again, there's a lot of transient communities there. Um, There are companies like the Coca-Cola World Headquarters is there, UPS, Porsche for the US, um, Mercedes, and also lots of consulates are based there. So back about 37 years ago now, a group of people saw a need to have an international school where students could study in other languages. Because at the time in Atlanta, it was very easy to go to schools and study in English, but having a place where students could study in Spanish and German and French was something that didn't exist at the time. So this very, very small community of people got together and they started Atlanta International School. And now it is just blown up into a community that not only has the three languages, but a fourth one as well, which is the Mandarin program. And it's just really fun because you end up with this really interesting mix of kids who have that international identity. There are a lot of third culture students there that are maybe there for only one or two years, but there's also a community of people who one parent is from somewhere abroad, but the other parent's an American. So then it's that just like full mix of different types of cultures and melting pots all in one place. And it just having the IB program there makes sense due to the transience of students. So they're able to move on to another IB school in the future. And yeah, it's just a fun place. It was a really interesting experience to see how students who had just come in from other countries were understanding the landscape of the U.S. and like adapting to the U.S. And it was just, it was just fun to have that adventure, but in your own home country. Yeah, I can imagine that. And when you say, just for clarity, when you say the four languages, were they Mm -hmm. like the whole course was taught or the whole program was taught in that language? So say if you're a Spanish speaker, you could do your whole schooling in Spanish or was it mixed with English still? How did that work? So in the primary years program, they do a 50-50 model of the languages. And then in the secondary program, you were able to study different levels of either language literature or language acquisition. And then you could even take your humanities in your language. And then as, of course, you get up in the older years, the program switches more and more to English to get to prepare students for the deep diploma program. Yeah, I, I really love it. This is so fascinating. And I really want to talk more about your, your current role and what's going on in the Netherlands. But just to kind of maybe tie this up, you know, I, I said it in the intro, in my brain, it's almost like this reverse trajectory of international schooling where we often see schools at least initially set up for uh, expatriates working in countries where they need English and now that's become a phenomenon where almost all international schools seem to be or not all but a lot seem to be English language focused and then you have this this reverse thing where you've got this amazing community with multiple languages and and a melting pot of cultures what do you think it would be like? I mean, I can probably guess, but say compared to working in a general US school, like is does anything like this happen in the public system as opposed to something like what you experienced at AIS? I mean, I, I do believe that public schools in the US are also their own versions of melting pots, but I don't believe that there's necessarily this, this community focus on language. And to have cultures represented in such an equal and open way. Um, I think that's something that 
when you strip that identity of language and you take that away from students, like in their day-to-day experience at school, I think it, it kind of takes a little piece of them away. And of course, part of international schooling is one of the goals is we want students to go out and explore the world. And, you know, oftentimes we know that English is one of those languages that do connect people, but a lot of international schools, I find personally still have that cultural heritage and that pride that they want students to also have. And I, I think that parts of that can exist in normal American school communities, but not nearly as much as it's showcased in the international school communities. Yeah, it sounds like a quite a special place specifically as well, AIS, with, with its structure. Really cool. Thanks for exploring that with me. And I would love to yeah, hear from anyone else in the community that would like to add to this conversation or has a similar or different experience working in a context like this. Let's go to the Netherlands. And I mean, let's just start at the beginning. You're only, what, six, seven months at the time of this recording into the role. What's it been like? What's it like working, living in the Netherlands? Yeah, um, you know, beyond the weather, which is always the biggest joke, everything they say about weather in the Netherlands is true. It is cold and it rains and it rains a lot. And I think um, learning how to ride your bike in extreme weather has been something that's been a really fun kind of adventure and not always the most pleasant experience. But beyond that, the school here is just such a interesting place. It is a lot bigger than my old school. It's almost twice the size. So I think going from a smaller community to a larger community is definitely a big um, kind of curveball. I have to get to know a lot more students. Uh, Class sizes are a little bit larger, but there's also something fun in having a full group all the time in your classroom and having the energy of all the bodies and all the people that you have to get to know and that know you. So I think that aspect of the largeness of this community has been something that's been a new adventure for me and really fun. Also, just being based here in The Hague, the idea of the international community is a very true thing. Something that kind of makes me giggle, but I I really love about our roster, for example, is on our class rosters next to the student's name, there's the flag of the country they're from. And in a group of 25, everyone's flag is different. And that's just something that I think is really special. And I think that there's a lot of consideration into how students are placed, but then even talking to students who have been here for years versus students who've been here for six months, everybody just has different adventures here. And it's kind of nice to be the new kid in a way, getting to know a new community, getting into new cultural things, even having students ask me questions about, oh, where have you been to visit? Or, hey, you should check out this restaurant and just getting to know a new place again. I think there's a lot of excitement in that. And that's a part of international teaching that sometimes we forget about when we've been at a place for a long time. That is a good point. And I mean, you mentioned the challenge of the weather and the rain. Has there been any other kind of major challenges that you've faced so far? I think in a way it's, this is a challenge, but it's something that I really enjoy. Um, In the US, the one thing that was always a bit challenging with students, especially when they entered the DP, is once they were accepted into an American college or university, They didn't need the diploma in order to have that contingent offer. Um, It's something that they could certainly get and receive credits for, but the stakes here in Europe are much higher. And I think because of that, our students like really, really push. And the idea of grades, they're very driven here in a different way because they just, they can't give up and they have to go to the finish line. And for me, that's something that I haven't seen in a while from students, like all the students wanting to push versus in the U.S. Sometimes some students might get what we call senioritis, where they kind of take a step back a little bit. Um, That culture doesn't necessarily exist here with our students, especially in our diploma program. They're they just they have pushed and pushed and pushed and they're they want to keep recording things and they want to keep trying and they want lots of feedback. And those grades are very, very important for them here. And I think part of that is their teacher. So having 
Mr. Wright in the classroom. I think he really pushes them, but I think also they have a lot of pride and a lot of heart in what they do here. And that's been something that's just been a nice challenge because they, they constantly want feedback. They constantly want to get better. They constantly want to create. And I think I haven't had students in a long time that are just so driven in this way in the older years. So it's been a it's been a really positive change, but it definitely is something that also makes me as the teacher have to like really step up and and really work with them in a way to continue to push them and continue to want to drive them to success. That's a great answer to that question. It's a really nice challenge in a way, but I can see how it would be a challenge. Yeah, and I think the other thing too is, you know, sometimes when we've been in communities where we've taught curriculum that's the same for a long time, we tend to get very comfortable in what we do. Um, And I've been very fortunate in coming to ISH. This is the first time in my career that I have walked into a program that had a curriculum, like a fully realized curriculum. And even though we're still developing and changing things, I've never walked into, I feel like most people experience this. I've never walked into a school and just had someone go, here you go. Here's our units. They've all been written up. Here's what we do. Help me make it better. And that's something that, you know, normally we come in as educators and we're starting from ground zero. And that might be for different reasons. Maybe it's different teaching styles coming into schools. Maybe it's just trying to flip and change everything. And we want to put our own twist on things. And I think that's something that's really important in what we do in our classrooms. But to just be able to come in and adapt to the environment and to get to know the kids and to not be so stressed out with the creation of things was something that was a huge change. I can imagine a fair few people listening going, yes, I arrived at school X and there was nothing or I had to start everything from scratch. So really nice. And then to be allowed to contribute to that. It wasn't just like, here's your thing and that's it. It's like, here's your thing. Let's make it better. Like you said, which is, that's really nice too. A bunch of MTIIS community members have successfully secured international school music teaching jobs after completing their online PGCEI or PGCE IQTS courses through the University of Warwick. If you're looking for a university qualification to teach music in an international school, this is the best option I've seen so far. To learn more and register, visit warwick.ac.uk forward slash CTE. That's W-A-R-W-I-C-K dot A-C dot U-K forward slash C-T-E. I want to ask about string teaching and MYP because right at the beginning you mentioned your sort of yeah your time in China and how that started with with playing in an orchestra right it was am I correct with that yeah yeah touring orchestra and then I'm yeah we've chatted a bit about your experience teaching strings but now your role is you know MYP DP music teacher MYP music subject coordinator How's that going for you? And how have you transitioned maybe between those two roles? I mean, they tend to have like string teacher is a thing, you know, almost like an identity and MYP music teacher can be seen as quite a different thing. How do they interact? How have you transitioned from one to the other? Do they still connect in a way for you? Yeah. So I think in the US, especially um, many music education programs are, you either go the route of I'm going to teach choir or I'm going to teach instrumental music ed. And um, I was actually talking about this yesterday. So funny in my undergrad, I took one course that was a combination of choral methods and general music methods in one semester. Yeah, And that was the only exposure to general music I had before teaching it Um, because I had gone the route of, I want to become an orchestra director. And that had been my passion in my in the younger part of my career. So when I jumped abroad and started teaching general music, it was kind of, it was a pretty scary thing to now be in a classroom with a bunch of first and second graders like trying to teach music. And fortunately I had my I had my music books from college that I dragged in my suitcase with me and I made it work. And as you start to teach more and more, of course you grow and develop. And when I started teaching middle school and high school general music, 
that's when I realized like, oh, I really like this. There's something really fun about this. And when I moved back to the US, I now had this dual role where I was doing string orchestra programs and I was doing MYP teaching. And I still realized that where I feel most comfortable is in the general music classroom. And I think that kind of creates an identity crisis for the American music teacher because I was going to all these networking events and meeting people and everyone is, I am the band director. I am the orchestra director. And at many American international schools, I find that that culture still exists of having just those instrumental music programs. So finding a school for me personally that offered the MYP was something that was really important to me because I wanted to still teach general music. Now at my last school, I did have the opportunity to transition the ensemble program with my team of teachers that I was working with there into the MYP. And that was a really interesting thing to do because now we were combining that rehearsal time in the classroom with the MYP program. So it, for me, the biggest thing about that and something that I talk about all the time when I teach MYP workshops is you have to get off the podium. So now how are you teaching still this idea of we're going to do projects and we're going to be passion based in certain concepts and skills, but how can I still teach that repertoire that I want to teach? How can I still get them ready for performance? And I think that's just, that was such an interesting and fascinating ride. And then coming here, I'm going back into that very international school style of having the general music classes during the day and having the ensemble programs be co-curricular after school. So it's been interesting to, I've literally flip-flopped both of these things throughout my entire career. And I think there's joy in both of them. It takes a very different set of skills, but something that I think when I'm working, especially with ensemble-based groups that I really consider is at the end of the day, my kids don't need the trophy. I don't need the plaque on the wall. That was never something that was important to me. And I just, from my personal beliefs, I don't want to be in a program that does that. But what I do want the kids to walk away with is feeling like they were part of a group, learning how to listen to each other, learning how to work together and build those skills as a team. And that's something that only on uh, ensemble and sports programs, those are the two places where you can create that synergy with a student that, it, that I find the most. And then you also get to know them on such a deeper and more personal level. So I, while I, even though I flip-flop between the two and I, I clearly have the love for MYP and general music, just that ensemble based idea is something that I still always want to have in whatever school I end up working in. Can I probe a little bit more on this transition? Because you said, if I understood correctly, the idea of get off the podium was the line that I think I remember you using, which makes sense. Would there be any other words of wisdom or pieces of advice that you would give to someone that's maybe doing that transition? Like, I would like to even understand more what that actually meant to get off the podium. Did, were you literally in the ensemble more or... Like, how did, how did that work? Yeah. Can you explore that any further? Yeah. So I, I think a lot of it was we developed this really beautiful unit last year where we were having the students take ownership of their own ensemble. So it was looking at the literature. Everybody set a goal. And then it was working with the students individually on how they were going to achieve their goal. So it was we used the statement of inquiry as the driver for the goal. So they actually wrote a goal using words from the statement of inquiry about how they were going to push and overcome their own boundaries. So their own thing holding them back. We had a rehearsal process. We did um, something really fun. We did a redemption concert. So the students had to pick a piece from their last concert that they felt didn't go so well. And then we turned around and rehearsed it in two or three weeks. And then we performed it in front of the entire secondary school. That's a really cool idea. I like that. Yeah. So they had a re-performance of something that they felt didn't go well. And then we compared the recordings. Of course, it got better. Um, but also playing for their peers, of course, brings an entirely different level 
to the playing field. So, and at the end of that semester, it was, it was so good and it was so great. And just watching the kids really figure out ways that they could individually improve. They talked about it within the music, how they had rehearsed, you know, when they talked about criterion B, like developing skills, they were showing us exactly how they were breaking down smaller elements of the music, using their method book to improve. And then at the end, they actually did a, was really fun. They did an elevator pitch. So they had two minutes to explain how their goal had been enacted in their plane and how it made them a better ensemble member. So it ended up just being this really fun unit. But again, it required like really having one-on-one conversations with the kids, being able to help them break down their music, help them market in a new way. And, you know, that's part of that process journal piece that's in the MYP that we don't always talk about. And oftentimes a lot of people ask, okay, I'm running a band. How do I use a process journal? And that's about like marking music and really documenting it and figuring out how to, yes, we can use Flipgrid and yes, we can use Music First and all these other programs, but how do we get kids writing about their process? And I think that was an interesting thing to try to figure out how to do at that ensemble base level. Very well put. I love it. And I was trying to interpret my question, which was how do you get off the podium? And I think it makes so much sense. It's just about having a student's like you said, process, reflective process, giving them ownership. Like there were so many moments as you were speaking there, I was like, wow, it'd be so cool to to be a student experiencing that sense of ownership over the ensemble and the direction of the ensemble. So much there. Thanks for exploring that. That, that really was cool to, to unpack. And I'm probably going to think about that for quite a while. That's a really good process. So MYP then, especially, uh, you know, I mean, specifically now at ISH, your subject coordinator for MYP and we can hear the passion you have for the MYP and how it applies to music. Can you tell us like what is one favorite unit that you're working on or that you're teaching and why? Yeah, definitely. Um, So this was a unit that I joke came back out of the vault in a sense. Um, It wasn't the original unit we were going to teach at the top of the year. So originally we had been slated to teach a unit on musicals. And for me personally, it just wasn't a unit that was really speaking to me when I was looking through the materials, because I still think it's really important that you have to teach something that you you yourself are passionate about. If you teach a unit that someone else wrote, but you don't connect to it, it just makes it so much more difficult to teach. And I went back to my colleague, Samuel, and we, and we talked about it. And I said, hey, there's this unit, this other unit sitting on managed back that I think is really interesting that we should explore. So uh, the title of the unit is Do Images Have Sound? And it is this beautiful unit that is all about how we connect music to visual art. So it explored the work of Kandinsky. And then from there, we go into how composers connect sound to color or sound to shapes. And then we continue to explore sound to movement. And when we do that, we look at Pixar films. We talked about legends and stories and how they're wrapped up in the culture of music. And then we actually start to create and compose music based off of visual art. And what was really fun is at the end of the unit, we ended up doing an art source that I adore that is from the city of Atlanta, which is this street art project called Tiny Doors. So it is about a um, a visual artist that's based in Atlanta that puts little tiny doors all over the city and she decorates them based on the neighborhoods. So we did a, we had just studied an American in Paris and we had talked about motivic development and techniques that's used by Gershwin. And then we applied some of those techniques in an American walking through Atlanta. So then we did research on the city. We used Google Maps to actually physically walk around the spaces. We learned about the locations that the doors are in. And we used that to inform the music that the students composed. And it ended up being just a really fun unit that we had built such a large and rich toolbox of compositional techniques. The students were able to pull from them to write these beautiful, like only 30 seconds of music, but still these really well written 30 second pieces that use the techniques that we had studied from the whole term. 
And the kids were just so excited to write music. Every class they came in and every class there was, we're going to learn about a new piece of art and now we're going to try this new technique. And we might practice that technique for a week, but it was just getting them into music score, using ORF instruments, throwing them in practice rooms on pianos or letting them pack their own instruments into the classroom. And it was just constant, let's practice all these different skills. And then they took those skills and created. And it was just, it was a beautiful unit and it was so successful. And the students now are working on an improvisation unit and they have so much confidence in just being able to write and play in front of each other. And there's no worry about, oh, I don't want to play my music in front of someone else because we had practiced it so often in term one that now it's like a big open sharing session almost every class with the kids. And that's been something that's been really enjoyable here. So two things. One is really nice way to bring in your own context, like of Atlanta. I'm imagining that would have been quite special. And that's a nice idea for people to think about. And secondly, a question, which is, you mentioned the students use MuseScore. So I'm imagining this was sort of standard Western notation. That was kind of the output. Was there some connection to, and maybe I missed this, but some connection to the visual art element in the final kind of presentation of the work or delivery of the work? Was it like you saw the artwork with the motifs or how did that sort of happen? Yes, we were based in MuseScore and we did a lot of things with standard Western notation, but actually we had begun the unit just by doing graphic scoring. So we broke out a bunch of different colored pens and pencils. And for the first couple pieces before we got into notation, we actually just drew images. So we would listen to music and we would draw the lines and we would draw the swirls and the squiggles and the sounds. And that idea definitely translated into the brainstorming part of their project. So they might talk about like, I want the music to sound like this. And instead of, draw instead of explaining it with words, they might draw small sketches or ideas which was something that was open to interpretation. When it came to, they, they did a final presentation. And when it came to that final presentation, they actually had to annotate their own scores. So then that was a really cool thing in their presentations. When they showed the artwork, they explained what inspired them. And then they turned around and they actually had their scores on the screen. And they had used either highlighters or colored pens or had used something in paint, for example, on... Um, their computers, and they had actually written like, here's where I fragmented my motif. Here's where I have a sequence. Here's where I augmented my rhythm to stretch it out. So it was really interesting to have. And these are just your 10 students. So still, we've got a couple of years before DP already are able to break down and annotate on their scores and show us where their motifs have been developed. So... I mean, is there any other bits you want to share about what you're doing at NYP or, or is that a good sort of summary from that unit? I think that's a, I mean, that's a great summary. I think in general, something that we do that's really important that I think sometimes people can get stuck on with NYP is we are constantly still creating and playing. I think sometimes people feel like NYP has to be very driven in factual knowledge and it has to be a lot of skill building. But then some people ask, like, where does that playing aspect come in? Where's the fun of it? And something that I feel that we do here very well, especially in the younger, younger years, so year seven and year eight, we constantly have instruments out. We're constantly still making music. So what I just would want to say in general is you can still have both with NYP. It doesn't have to be one or the other. And I think it's still really important that when we're in these general music classes, we're still there to make music and there's still so much joy and discovery of learning that happens when we just create. And I think that's a really important thing that still needs to be happening in the classroom, even with skill building. I would almost say I would rather have my students take longer to understand what a, the word interval is and how they would describe that. But I would rather play intervals over and over again instead and have them just creating and listening and building their hearing skills. And the, the language and the vocabulary will come later. But the skill building, if you take that away and you take away the joy of making music, then we're just gonna build students that maybe resent our subject. And that's something that I don't wanna see happen. I want to see that joy when they come in the room, knowing that we get to play, we get to have fun. And just keeping that playfulness 
in our subject alive, I think is something really important in the MYP that can sometimes unfortunately get lost. Great point. Well, this has been so nice. And thank you for, yeah, deep diving on that unit in particular. Um, I guess just a question out of interest, but I'm sure listeners might be thinking, would you be happy to share some of the like bones of that unit if people wanted to do it or try it in their own school? Absolutely. Um, I am happy to share some materials. I'm also happy to share. There are a couple examples that we have up on the LinkedIn page, my LinkedIn page, and also Samuel Wright's LinkedIn page of actual recordings of the students' works. So those are easily, you can go on, you can see those, but if you're curious, I would be more than happy to share more materials or things about that unit. That's so cool. And we'll make sure we link to your LinkedIn page in the show notes for everyone. And maybe also to yeah anything else that you're happy to share, we'll also link that into the show notes. But that's a great suggestion. Just while we're on that, is that kind of the best way to contact you? If someone's thinking, oh, I'd really love to chat more with Rebecca and sort of like learn more about maybe that transition from strings to MYP or what you've just spoken about with with the MIP unit. Is that the best way to catch you at the moment, LinkedIn? Yes, I would say LinkedIn is the quickest way to get a hold of me. And also just in general, I think what's so nice, not only about this podcast, but also about the community right now of LinkedIn is that's that's how I found my people. That's how I think when we're, we feel so isolated sometimes in our schools and we have this amazing online community that you can even just search like hashtag MYP music or hashtag general music. And there's amazing things out there right now. So definitely um, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer questions or just even have a chat with people. But I feel like this is how I found my people. So I would encourage people to also do that as well. Mm, I would agree with that. Yeah, LinkedIn is such a useful space, like a really genuinely useful space these days. Rebecca, what's what's ahead? 2024, at the time of recording, we're in sort of end of Feb. What's uh, what's the rest of the year looking like for you? What are you looking forward to about 2024? Yeah, we're in a really interesting position right now. We just hired on a new colleague who also has been featured on your podcast. Um, <laughs> which, is so, which is so random because we had no idea that that <laughs> was going to happen. But yeah, it was so good. Um, so we have a new music colleague, Emilio Pereira, who is a part of our teaching team. And just he is as passionate as the rest of us on the team and just getting to know a new team member, continuing to build and develop curriculum. I love being in the MYP role. It is something that I feel very confident in doing. And just I'm excited to keep exploring and building and developing curriculum. And I think when you're with people that also have that passion, that excitement, we can we can only go up from here. So I'm just looking forward to making music, working with new creative people, and just seeing how we can grow and develop as a team. Well, thank you again so much for taking the time. And I'm looking forward to catching up with you again and um, maybe going for a bike ride and seeing if we can stay upright in the, uh, the dodgy Dutch weather. Before we wrap up, is there anything you want to leave us with? Any questions, thoughts, comments, final things uh, before we before we wrap up? I would just say, please, let's continue to build community. And podcasts like this are really important. And Chris, thank you for having me today. Pleasure. Thank you so much. And yeah, catch you again soon, I hope. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. Listen to other episodes by visiting mtiis.com or learn more about our community on Facebook by simply searching for Music Teachers in International Schools. If you know someone who you think I should get on the podcast, I'd love to hear from you. You can find me at chriskulma.com, C-H-R-I-S-K-O-E-L-M-A.com. See you next time.